Take out your church app and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. If you're ready for the word, say aloud, loud amen. amen. All right, Philippians chapter 4. Let me do a little recap of where we have been. If you're new with us, I have been in a two-part series. Last week, Pastor Scott Hagen, the president of North Central University, was with us. If you did not have opportunity to listen to that message, I highly encourage you to do so. It was powerful. Uh, But two weeks ago, I began a two-part series called Thanks and Giving. And of course, I've already covered the thanks part. I want to go quickly and give you a little recap because we had a week off in between. I did an acrostic or an acronym for the word thanks. I will be doing the same for the word giving because I find out on the holidays, if you can do it as an acrostic, it tends to stay with you more. You tend to remember those words or phrases even more. So thanks, once again, was redeem the time. We are to redeem the time. H was practice hospitality. A was check the attitude. I said that your attitude determines your altitude, how far you're going to go in life. N, give to the needy. K was be kind. And S, I believe, was the best. Think of your salvation often, because if you do that, all the other ones will fall into proper place. This morning, I'd like for you to look now at Philippians 4. I'm going to start at verse 10, and we're going to talk about the second component of giving. Paul says this to the church of Philippi, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though surely you did care but you lack the opportunity to be able to give. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am. That doesn't mean the state of Michigan. That means wherever he finds himself to be as a person and as a condition, to be content. I know how to be a base. That means I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and also to be hungry, both what it is like to abound and also to suffer need. And then verse 13, we know this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you, again, he's talking to this church that is actually in dire need, the Philippians. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account, meaning what your gift was able to produce for the kingdom. Verse 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. They are a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And we all know verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, God, for your word. God, as I I provide context today to see what it was like for a church that was in need, not saying that Holland First is in need. I'm talking about the church of Philippi. They knew what it was like to have poverty, but yet in the midst of that poverty, generosity began to well up within them. They gave even out of their lack. God, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I pray this morning that you would give me clarity in my mind. And I pray that every word that comes out of this mouth would come from your throne. And God, I pray that your anointing would rest upon every one of us to hear your word and to once again be changed by it. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And we all said together, Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, Victoria. Something I found really neat uh, as I was uh, preparing this sermon about a week ago or so is the fact that almost any time, and this is key that you hear this at the start because it kind of sets the stage for this message, but almost every time you hear 
the word giving, of course, you naturally think giving is to give someone something. It's the giving of something. But as I read throughout the pages of the word of God, more times than not, when it talked about giving, it was also followed by thanks. And so I'd like to show that to you today, because how appropriate is that in light of this two-part series, and you see it on the screen, thanks and giving. Listen to how they go hand in hand. Ephesians 5, verse 4, Paul says to the Ephesians, and he kind of builds into, he says, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting. So he's going over behavior. He says, which are not fitting, but what is fitting? Rather the giving of what? Thanks. And then he says in verse 20, Ephesians 5, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul is speaking to the church in Coloss, Colossians chapter one, verse 12. He starts it basically the same way. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And then two chapters later, Colossians 3, verse 17, he says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, doing what? Giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, therefore I exhort you first of all that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So church, there is something about, even when we come to the Lord in prayer with our needs, that we need to do it with thanksgiving. Can I hear an amen today? There needs to be a giving of thanks. Listen to Hebrews 13, 15. I love this verse. Again, we don't know for sure who the author of Hebrews is, but in Hebrews 13, 15, he says this. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. So church, what I am establishing here today is that thanks and giving are part and parcel of each other. Listen to this phrase here or these two statements. You cannot show true thankfulness without giving. It just doesn't happen. When you are thankful, you give. And the next statement is, you can't show true giving without thankfulness. I want you to say this out loud if you know the fill-in. Paul said to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, he says, God loves a what giver? I'm glad that no one said God loves an angry giver. Because he doesn't want you angry. He wants you cheerful. In fact, if you look at it in the Greek, you've heard me share it before, but in the Greek it says, God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful in the Greek is hilario. And it's where we get the word hilarious. It doesn't mean that when we pass the baskets, we all need to be laughing out loud unless you want to. But it just goes to show we have so much to be grateful for. We should have a heart of thanksgiving and be cheerful when it comes time to give. It's a matter of the heart. I am convinced that God's favorite word is either give or it's gave. It's either give or it's gave. Because even Unsaved people know this first. You could go to a football game today in the NFL and in one of those stadiums in the end zone, you're gonna see what verse? John chapter three and verse what? 16. And say it with me if you know it. For God so loved the world, the whole thing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We usually stop with verse 16, but we need to read verse 17 as well because sometimes we think, oh God, thank you that you gave your son, but notice what Jesus came to do. For God did not send his son into the world to what? To condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Can you give our God praise this morning? We have much to be thankful for. We have much to be thankful for. 
Here's a story of giving I came across. His name is R.G. Le Thoreau. He was, he was born in the late 1800s, but he lived all the way to the year I was born, 1969. He was a Christian, a devout Christian, but he was also an industrialist. He was, uh, he was one of those guys that was dedicated to having a life and a successful business that would glorify Jesus Christ. He said, I wanted to be a businessman for God. He became hugely successful. I want you to understand what I'm about to say. He came from very humble beginnings. He knew what it was a lot like the Apostle Paul. He knew what it was like to be abased. But as he gave his life to the Lord and he began to find out what it was like to give, he says this, my, my company became hugely successful. He literally began designing and developing his own line of earth moving equipment. So those huge pieces of equipment that move the topsoil and move the earth. He was the maker. He became the maker of nearly 300 inventions. Has anybody been the inventor of one thing here? Would you lift your hands? Okay. You probably have invented something. Maybe no one knows about it. Maybe you just need to get it patented. But he developed 300 inventions he had hundreds of patents that were then done to protect what God had prospered him with. And listen to this. As he succeeded financially, he began to increase his giving to the point when his company was doing the best, he was able to give 90% of his income to the Lord's work. He would live on the 10% and give the other 90% away. This is a quote that he said. Again, his name is R.G. Le Thoreau. And I love this quote. I shovel out the money and God shovels it back, but God has a bigger shovel. I think that is powerful. God has a bigger shovel. And you might be thinking, you know, Pastor Mike, I would love to give 90%, but you know, he was a multimillionaire. But again, he didn't start out that way. So here is a gentle challenge I would like to propose to you. It was his challenge as well. That whatever percentage of your income you are currently giving, and we know that we are to give a tenth to the Lord as a tithe, but whatever percentage of your income you are currently giving, make a lifelong plan. Make it a plan, make it a desire that goes into a plan of action to bump that percentage with every opportunity God allows you to be able to do it. And I believe you'll be blessed. Go with me, if you would, now to Mark chapter 12. And there you're going to find the epitome of what I believe giving looks like. And I want to make it abundantly clear. Many times giving does involve our finances, but sometimes it does not. But I want you to take in, point, take in case this point here in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 45. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury, meaning there was a treasury box that was given to support the Lord's ministry. And people would give into the treasury box. So he sat opposite of the treasury. And he saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, because they were watching probably as well. And he says to the disciples, remember, they're probably thinking this lady hardly gave a thing. But he said, surely I say to you that this poor widow, notice he, he does acknowledge the fact that she's poor. This poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. Can you imagine how those disciples probably thought, Jesus, you've been out in the sun too long. All these rich people are giving a lot and you're saying this little widow who gave her two mites gave more? Listen to what verse 44 says. For they all put in out of their what? Say it out loud if you see it. They put in out of their abundance. But she gave out of her, say it out loud, poverty. She gave not out of her abundance, but out of her poverty. She put in what all that she had, her entire livelihood. It would be like a millionaire giving all million dollars. 
She gave what she had and she gave it all. In fact, I did a little research on this. I've done it before, but I needed to be reminded. Two mites is this, and they have it on the screen. It is 164th, 164th of a denarius. A denarius was worth a day's pay for a skilled laborer. Kind of like Victor Castillo back there supporting that Michigan sweatshirt. He's a skilled laborer. So it would be like this. She only gave 164th of a day's wages. And yet Jesus says these awesome words about her life. Doing the math, it would be the equivalent of one eighth of a cent. I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of embarrass myself here. Not really. You might think, big deal. But there has been times when I have found a penny on the ground. And what do they say? A penny? Penny saved is a penny earned. There are times I didn't even save it. I would just find a penny. And instead of carrying it around in my pocket, I would throw it away. I'm serious. You might say, look at me like, what in the world are you thinking? I thought I'd rather just throw it away than have it in my pocket where I'm going to hear it in a dryer spinning around someday like crazy. (laughs) Seriously. Doing the math, it would be the equivalent of one eighth of one cent. But Jesus, if you don't hear anything else in this part here, Jesus saw the heart of this woman that she gave all that she had. There was no holding back. No holding back. That's what God is looking for out of us today, church. When it comes to our giving, whether it's giving of our time, giving of our talents, giving of our abilities, giving of our finances, giving of our resources to help someone in need. And what a better time than here we come to talk about thanks and to talk about giving than at a time where we gather around tables in the United States like we did this past Thursday and we show thankfulness to God and to each other. I want to say this before I dive into these six traits of giving. I am so thankful today. This is not hyperbole. This is not just the pastor trying to say it because he's a pastor. I am so thankful that Jesus Christ gave his life for me and the least I can do is give back with a grateful heart and a myriad of ways for all that Jesus has done in my life. He's done so much, church. He saved us. We sang that song just a couple of weeks ago. Church, if he never does another thing for us, and guess what? He already did it. You're here this morning. He got you out of bed and got you into the house of the Lord. But if he never does another thing, he's done enough by giving his son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I don't want you in that turkey coma today. Turkey kind of makes you tired and so forth. I want you alert, and I'm so thankful that you're here today. I know a lot are maybe out and coming back in from different places of family, but I'm glad you're here to hear this today. Gee, our lives should be marked by a spirit of generosity. There has to be that that attitude in our hearts that we want to be generous with our life. I want to make something also very clear. You may disagree with me here, but this is just what I see if I know God's word like I think I do. I do not see giving a tithe as being generous. I do not see giving a tithe as being generous because I see it as following a commandment of the Lord. It belongs to him already. And again, you might not agree with this next statement, but I also believe that not all times, so I'm not throwing the baby out of the bathwood here, so don't think I'm making an overall statement. I'm just saying In some ways, even giving above and beyond as an offering is not even being generous. Let me tell you why I say that. The book of Malachi, God said the people in that particular case, they had robbed him not only in tithes, but in what? But in offerings. Hope everybody's listening to me today. But in tithes, but also in offerings. It means as God prospers us, we are to be able to give as he prospers us. It's like this, whose shovel are you gonna use, yours or God's? 
I would rather live on 90% and trusting God to help me to be able to do what I need to do than to try to live on the 100% without God. Every single time. But God said it, he will see it come back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. In fact, we know the first command with a promise is that children should obey their parents so that they would live a long life. Because back in the Old Testament under law, hear me, let me tell you why they shared that scripture, so that you might live long. Because if in the Old Testament under the law, if they would, if they would do certain things, they would be killed. But now in the New Testament, thank God we're under grace, but I think grace actually calls us higher. But I believe in the Old Testament under the law, you know, it was a requirement. But now in the New Testament, I believe it's just a starting point. I believe that tithes and offerings are just a starting point as God prospers us. Hope you're hearing, I know you're hearing me here, but I need you to hear me right here. Offerings are above and beyond giving as God prospers you. No matter the case, no matter what you might, you might think, I believe that God would want me to share this. Our lives as believers and followers of Jesus Christ must be marked by a spirit of generosity. It has to be marked by a spirit of generosity. I wanna share a story. There was a man, and I, I will not give names because it was a long time ago. But there was a particular church where I was a youth pastor where more times than I would care to count, he would come up to me and he would say, for whatever reason, he would say it to me. And I didn't understand why he felt that he had to share it with me instead of one of the other pastors because it was a rather large church. But he would come up to me and say, Pastor Mike, all, you, all this church wants is my money. And I would look at him and I would say, I don't think I've ever come to you and asked for money. I don't think the church has ever come and asked for you for money. Well, he's like, well, you always, you know, do the tithes and offerings and you're expecting me to give. You know, church, I felt sorry for him because he was missing out on what a generous heart does in the life of a believer. And case in point, he was blaming the church for principles that God gave, not the church. Their principles that God gave, the church was just living those principles out. But the sad thing was he simply did not look at giving the way I think God wants us to look at it. I also will say this. I believe that he missed out on a lot over the course of his life as a result. But even to the fact, and this pains me to say it, he was stingy with his son who had a calling on his life. His son had a bona fide calling to be a pastor. I knew it, that he knew it, even his dad knew it. But he even told me once he thought pastoring wasn't a good call for his son because he would never make a lot of money. He said, and I literally quote, Pastor Mike, you need to have a fallback plan. I looked at him and I said, well, if you think you have to have a, a fallback plan, that must mean you think you're gonna fail. And I have known Jesus all of my life and he has never failed me yet and he's never ever gonna fail me. And here I am, 32 years a pastor, but to this day, that, hit, that young man is now a, a full grown man, probably in his mid 30s to even around 40. He's doing good in life, he's got a good occupation, but if you were to ask him, he would tell you that he is in the permissive will of God and not the perfect will of God. Why? Because his dad did not have a generous heart. And church, I know that's a very strong statement for me to say, but I saw it fleshed out in real time, in real life. Generosity is showing a readiness to give more of something. Maybe it's money or time than is strictly necessary or expected. It's going above and beyond. Listen to 2 Corinthians 8, verses one to three. This is in the NIV. This is the words of Paul to the Corinthian church. He says, and now brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace, unmerited favor, that God has given the Macedonian churches, plural. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, but notice the last part, entirely on their own. They didn't need to be asked, they didn't need to be persuaded. They didn't even need to be reminded. They simply 
excelled in generosity despite going through a severe trial. Church, that's when you know it's real. That's when you know that it's real. In the context here, sometimes we miss this, Paul here was using the example of the Macedonians. Who were the Macedonians? They were a group of people that were made up of the Philippians, the Thessalonians, and the Bereans. And so he was trying to motivate this church in Corinth to give generously by using the model of the Macedonians. But this is key. The Macedonians were in affliction and deep poverty, yet they gave joyfully and liberally. They didn't give out of anger. They didn't give out of even wanting to get. They gave out of joy and they gave liberally. I have learned this. this again, this is just my opinion. I believe sometimes it's not necessarily poor people, but maybe people that would not be considered rich by world standards. Many times they are more generous than people that are rich. Why? Perhaps the reason is they tend to rely upon God more. Can I get an amen today? Are you with me? I think you are in a turkey coma this morning and I need you to wake up. I know I'm talking about finances and I know as a pastor, you know, sometimes I try to avoid these topics, but I can't avoid these principles that are found in God's word because we're talking about thanks and we're talking about giving. Let me give you the principles of generosity. Under the Old Testament, Old Testament giving was by law. Under the New Testament, it's to be done out of love. Old Testament giving has obligation as its center. It's an obligation. Under the New Testament giving has others at its center. It's about other people. Old Testament giving was by percentage. New Testament giving is by proportion. For the Macedonians, despite their own need, they gave above and beyond to help with the work of God to be able to continue. And in the Old Testament, the Old Testament giving, it was a responsibility, but New Testament giving is a response to God's love. I love that. When you recognize how much God has done for you and the love he has for you, you are compelled to give. I must move on. G, our lives should be marked by a spirit of generosity. What does giving look like? I, looks out for the interests of others. Look no further than the letter of the Philippians to see this in action. Look at Philippians chapter two, starting at verse one. Therefore, If there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, some translations say, or vain conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Look at verse four now. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the what? The interests of others. I'll say it this way. Despite what was said between two brothers in the Old Testament, in many ways as Christians, we are our brother's keeper. In many ways, we are our brother's keeper. That doesn't mean we enable people. That doesn't mean we, we feel like they, they're gonna be able to control us and take advantage of us. That's not what I'm talking about. God has given us a brain to use wisdom there. No, it simply means we are to be on the lookout for those that could use a little help in doing things that would be in their best interest. For sake of time, let me go to the next one because I see what time it is. The rest of these things that I won't be sharing are in your notes today so you can look at it. But I wanna go to the next one. What does giving look like? I'm under the letter V now. It gives value to those they come into contact with. I wanna give you a practical example. You might think this is corny, but this is the first thing I thought of. But let's say you have a friend or a colleague that's in a room. They're in a room. And you enter that room. You enter and your response to them is, there you are, there you are. Or you walk into the room and go, there you are. Which one would rather hear the first than the last? Of course, we're gonna want to hear someone say, hey, there you are, instead of, oh, there you are, I I didn't expect you. You see, church, the reason I bring that up is one shows value, the other shows contempt. 
I love it when somebody walks in the room and says, hey, Pastor Mike, how's it going? Instead of, oh, hey, Pastor Mike, see you later. I mean, I'm thinking, okay, see you later. What did I do? We need to show value into people's lives, church. We're living in, in dire times. I mean, think about it. We live in a world where everybody's so hostile but we need to live as the fragrance of Christ to give value to people. One shows value, the other shows contempt. But I've learned in life sometimes, what do they say? Say it with me, familiarity breeds contempt. Sometimes the ones that we should value the most, we value the least. And it's the ones we're around the most. Show value. Don't show contempt. I wanna give up 10 ways right here, 10 ways to value other people or just to value others in general. And these sound so simple, but I believe if we will practice them, the, the world will be a better place. Number one, offer encouragement. Offer encouragement. You know, I could have used some encouragement yesterday. <laughs> could have used some encouragement. I don't even know if they're here. I don't see them here today, but... Yesterday, you know, and, and I know I have family here, especially my son, Caleb. He always gets on me. Dad, just you don't need to talk about it. Well, you know, I do things differently than my son does, I guess. But, you know, because I'm a pastor and I'm getting up here and talking in front of you, happen to be Michigan fans and all these type of things. And the game was done and I thought, okay, now I got to go to church tomorrow. <laughs> but I knew I had a sermon to prepare, but it was this. I, I, I went outside to to do some things outside because I noticed a lot of leaves had blown into the front of our house and I didn't want my mom and dad to slip on it so I was blowing the leaves out. I wish I had brought it today, but I didn't think about it. But there was a couple in this church that has a, a young man as a son. They even have a, they have a daughter. And I, it could have blown away, but on our front porch, right next to a little um, Frosty the Snowman that I put out, they put a little letter. It was in a card, and they put it in there, and I opened it up, and I thought, uh-oh. And I, because sometimes when, they, when they're unaddressed, I'm thinking, oh boy. But it said, Pastor Mike on the front. I said, okay. They know me as a pastor. And I opened it up, and it said, Pastor Mike and Amy, we just want to let you know that we love you more than any football game or a football score. You're an awesome pastor. And I, I almost started to cry. I thought, I'm already kind of feeling low, and this happened. But I thought, you know what? It was their way of saying, you know, Pastor Mike, we value you. We value you. We know that you, you like your team, and it hurts, but we value you. We thank you for the times that you've invested in my life. Let me tell you something. I got rid of the envelope because I didn't need it, but I will keep that letter forever. Not because of some game, but because they imparted value into my life. Offer encouragement. Number two, smile and take time to ask, how are you? You know, be careful, church. Sometimes we're like, hey, how are, how are you? And you're really not looking for a response. But be willing to say, how are you doing? And be willing to listen to what they have to say. Am I getting through today? Is God, is God getting through today? Number three, give the benefit of the doubt. That's another one. Can I say in families, sometimes the ones that we love the most, you know, sometimes we can get into certain things. And I just feel led to say, Let's be willing to give people the benefit of the doubt, to look past things. Number four, give of your own resources, whatever that means. Number five, ask questions and then listen well. Because if you ask it and they know you care, they'll start talking. Listen. Number six, offer to help. Offer to help. Number seven, be honest. Be honest. Number eight, serve without being asked. Serve without being asked. Number nine, invite. Nothing feels better than when you're invited in. When someone comes up to you and they invite you in to a conversation. Number 10, be patient. Again, very simple things this morning, church, but ones that I think need great practice times. Listen to Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9. This very passage, this very verse, I should say, is, is talking about the value of a friend. The value of a friend. If you'll put up Ecclesiastes, please. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9, the value of a friend passage. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Let me say that again. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Again, I'm not saying, what I'm about to say, I'm not saying you're not doing. 
but do all the more. Value your marriage. What if you just come up to your wife or your husband and just come up to them without any strings attached and you just say, I just want to let you know, I appreciate you. They probably look at you and say, okay, what do you want? What do you need? You know, sometimes, I'm just being honest, but value your marriage. And I know you do, but I'm just saying, value your marriage, value your children, value your church, value the colleagues and coworkers that God has put around you, value your friends that God has placed in your life. Most of all, value your relationship with Christ because when you do that, everything else will fall into proper place. It just does. Impart value everywhere you go and watch what happens. Listen to what H. Jackson Brown said, and I do encourage you to read 1 Samuel 26. It talks about the life of David or King Saul, how he was so jealous of David, but how David imparted value and how life came out of a bad situation. I encourage you to read it later, but H. Jackson Brown says this, don't forget a person's greatest emotional need is to feel appreciated. How many would agree with that? Even if you don't, just lift your hand for, to appease the pastor, okay? <laughs> okay. But we all wanna be appreciated. It's not that we go around saying, I wanna be appreciated, but no, there's that innate thing within, inside of us. The need to be needed and the need to feel appreciated. To know that I make a difference in someone's life. I wanna to go to the next one. I like the band to come if they would. I'm gonna give you these next three very quickly. But I wanna give you these and, and not, not do them justice. I, it invests in the lives of others. What does giving look like? It invests in the lives of others. Listen to what Paul says here in Philippians 2 about Jesus, our model of what it is like to invest in the lives of others. Listen to Philippians 2, starting at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Means what? We need to have the mind of what? Of who? Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Meaning, have the mind of Christ here. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with Father God but made himself of no reputation, the advent, the arrival of Jesus, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. That's where we get in the Greek, the kenosis, where he emptied himself of all this divine privileges and became human for us. The son of God became the son of man and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, which was the worst kind of death because cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. Jesus Christ took upon the curse of sin so that you and I might have abundant life. Church, think about the love that Jesus Christ, that he took that cross, all that punishment, and because he did it, he did it. The word therefore, and say it with me, the word therefore is what? It's there for a reason. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those of earth and even those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humility because he was willing to invest in us. When Jesus was on the cross, we were on his mind. And I think we should give him some proper praise and proper worship in the house of God this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Not only did Jesus die for your sins, but he arose from the dead for your justification. His resurrection guarantees your resurrection someday. And it's all because Jesus paid. He invested in you and he paid the price in church. His price that he paid was priceless. And the payback is simply investing in the lives of other people. 
He said, you are now the light of the world. Jesus came into the world and said, I am the light of the world, but correct me if I'm wrong. Later he said, and you are the light of the world. He invested in us. We should invest in others. Number one, how do we invest in the lives of others? I'll give you five quick ways. I'm just gonna read them. Number one, take time every day to show appreciation. Number two, invest time in relationships. Number three, listen with your heart and your ears. Truly listen. Number four, build trust. Building trust is the foundation of good relationships. So build trust. And number five, find ways to bring out the best in people. Church, find ways to bring out the best in people. Not the worst, but the best. Two more. In giving guards against narcissism. Giving guards against narcissism. Narcissism, or schism, excuse me, is that self-centered personality. When I read the definition, it talked about an excessive interest in one's physical appearance and image, and that really wasn't what I was looking for. But the next part is an excessive preoccupation with one's own needs, often at the expense of others. I wanna give you these, and again, for sake of time, we're going a little long today, but I just wanna give you the point, and I'd like for you to go home, and I'd like for you to look at the rest of it because you'll miss out on some really good things. Ray Burns, he's a pastor at High Point Church in Altoona, Iowa. Iowa. He talks about, are you a consumer or are you a servant? And he lists three things that consumers say that servants don't say. Number one, consumers say, I want a church with things I like. Church, hear me. Yes, it's good to come to a church with some things you like, but may the number one thing you like about more than anything else is that the truth of the gospel is being preached. Not the lights and all the bells and the whistles, not the coffee shop, but that the word of God is still foremost and central. It's the thing that still changes people's lives. The preaching of the gospel. Number two, A consumer will say, what do I get out of church? We have to come to a place, church, and again, I'm hurrying for time, and I I know some people don't like it when I say that, but I I just feel that I need to to keep on this, and then we're gonna end it out. Consumers say, what do I get out of church? Church, it's gotta be where it's not about you. It's about God, and it's about others. Then we come into this place, we're gonna love God, and we're gonna love people. Because church, I have found out that when I love God and I love people, it has a way of touching me. They say people, again, you've heard me say it before, people that are struggling with an emotional disorder, depression, seasonal, you know, defective disorder, whatever they call that thing, you know, and you need to get a, some vitamin D or a sun lamp, okay? I, I know those things happen because maybe you're not getting enough sunlight and there's different things, but doctors and psychologists will tell you that the number one way out of that predicament or depression or oppression is to serve. Because what does it do? It gets the attention off of you and it gets it on others. And what did Jesus Christ say? I did not come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So number two, consumers ask, what do I get out of church? Number three, consumers say, I want Christ, just not the church. I've heard people say it before, you know, people that have been hurt maybe by someone in a church. You know, they say, you know, Pastor Mike, I love the church, but I mean, I love Christ, but I just don't love the church. Well, you know, I've heard one, people, one person even said, you know, Pastor Mike, the church is full of hypocrites. And I say, well, there's always room for one more. Because correct me if I'm wrong, we're all sinners saved by grace. We're all sinners saved by grace. You follow me long enough, you're gonna see me make a mistake. But it's not about us, it's about Jesus Christ. It's about lifting up. The Bible says, if he be lifted up, he will draw everyone unto himself. But consumers say, you know, I want Christ, but not his church. Church, we're better together. I know we have a lot of people traveling today, and we have a lot of sickness going on, and I know we're coming out of the, you know, the COVID thing, but I'm still here to tell you as a pastor, we are better together. Two are better than one. We need each other. Life was not meant to be lived on an island. Life was not meant to be lived on an island. You take a person who somehow made it on a deserted island after five to 10 years, they come back and they don't even know how to function because they're not used to being around people. Church, 
The Bible says that we are to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. But the Bible says in Hebrews, we're to do so all the more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. That means the rapture of the church. We need to be in the house of God. Pastor Mike, I'm here. You're preaching to the choir. Well, you know what? I think we have a responsibility to go to those who aren't coming back. I think we have a responsibility to those who aren't coming back, even if you think it's not a legitimate reason. Jesus died for them, and we're called to impart value, to invest in them, and to show them that they are, have a place in God's kingdom and that we are better together. We should want Christ, and we should also love his church. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The church is more than a building. It's people. We invest in each other. And the last one this morning is G. This one says it all, and it links it all together. And I apologize for my mic going in and out. I'll try to get it corrected next week. It's what you get when you have a sweaty ear. It just moves all the time. But G, look to God. If we will do this one first, all the other ones will fall into place. Look to God. He is our example. Look out through the pages of his word. He has demonstrated what giving looks like. I've learned this. I love this little phrase that I came up with. The closer we get to him, the closer we will see his heart. And the closer we see his heart, you'll see it all has to do with giving. Acts 20, 20, Acts 20 verse 35 Acts is the history of the first 30 years of the early church. And Paul says this to the, the Ephesian elders. It's his farewell to the Ephesian elders. Acts 20, verse 35, and it's my farewell to you this morning. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We all tend to focus on it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. I want to focus on three words that come at the beginning. He says, remember the words. Remember. I think Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knew there was a propensity inside of people to forget the greatest example of all when it comes to giving, and that's God. If you keep your focus on him, giving will never be an issue. That last statement is worth its price in gold. It's worth the price of admission in here today. Say it again. Keep your focus on him, and giving will never be an issue. If you would stand to your feet today. I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. I want to, I want to say that we have elders and prayer partners here. We have some of our elders that are traveling and emailed me and they couldn't be here and that is fine. But I'd like to have prayer partners, intercessors, elders. I know we have, uh, we're light on pastors today due to sickness and our J-high is going on. But I would like for my prayer people just to be right around here and if people come, if you just come behind them and pray over them. But I just wanna, I just wanna pray this morning a prayer over you as we end out this message today, to have a heart of giving, to have a heart of thanks, and that long after this sermon is done, that you'll remember thanks and giving by following the example of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day we've, we've had together. God, thank you for this moment in time that we, as a body of believers at Holland First, have come to this point of the service for Lord you're wanting us to put into practice what we've heard but God it only comes into practice when it gets a hold of this right here because God what has my heart has my devotion and God you have my heart and so as a result you have my devotion in these areas that I would have a life of thanks and that my life would be one of giving and God, I pray that over each person. God, I pray that they would see in a powerful way when they begin to give, maybe even out of their own lack, where other people would say, that's not wisdom, that's a lack of wisdom. They would say, 
God has spoken. I'm trusting him. God, I believe that you will open the windows of heaven upon them. And God, it's not so that they can just con constantly be blessed, but Lord, it's so that they can be blessed to be a blessing. God, I've learned if you can get it through us, you will get it to us. And so God, I pray that your, your hand, long after we leave this place, we'd be thinking about what we have heard this day. And I give you the praise for that in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his incredible peace to the praise and to the glory of his name in Jesus name we all said amen before you leave out of here can we give the Lord one more shout of praise give him thanks for all that he has done in our life hallelujah praise the Lord again these altars are open if they could open the back door God bless you as you leave Check with your life group leader if you're having life groups. I know our life group is not meeting. We already had our Thanksgiving. But have an awesome day. God bless you.